Hi, everyone. It's Nancy Reyes with For Your Canine. And Joanne Swicky with For Better, For Worse. Lisa is celebrating her anniversary today, so she will not be joining us. Uh, let us know you're out there. Today, we're going to talk about how to choose a dog. Um, basically, from kind of going from the big, big wide spectrum to more narrow uh, information on, on selecting a dog for you and for your family. Um, and also to discuss... Uh, to discuss um, things that of the breed that you may already have, or when you choose um, certain breeds, some of the things that you'll have to deal with or that come inherent with the breed so that you can better understand and maybe change, you know, um, adjust your training or really, um, you know, figure out how to better live with the dog, right? Because it's like all breeds have different how can I say they have different habits or different tendencies that we see in certain breeds. And one of the, one of the biggest things, and I know Joanne sees it too. We have people that get certain breeds because they look cute or because they're um, somebody else has had them or whatever. And then they get the dog and they're like, Oh my God, this is a little bit more than they uh, bargained for. Wouldn't you say that's true, Joanne? Yeah. I mean that and energy. Right. I think there's people who like a dog or they like a certain breed of a dog or they think they'll like a certain breed of a dog and then realize it's crazy. <laughs> so I think a lot. I, I just, it's one of my breeds, right? People think Dobermans are lazy dogs and that is one of the biggest misconceptions ever. So they're not Rottweilers. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and so one of the things we wanted to, we're going to kind of chat a little bit before you. Um, before going to the, to, to the deeper stuff, um, why you choose a certain breed. Um, and again, a lot of times it's, oh, we've always had that breed or a friend of mine likes it or whatever. Um, or somebody has that breed. Well, the problem is the people, some of the people that may have that breed have a certain lifestyle that maybe you don't. And you might think you like the breed or you like the, you know, or, or you may just like the look of the dog, but not really consider uh, what that breed is, is bred to do and some of the behaviors that come along with that. Right. Um, everybody, every dog has certain, again, uh, inherent tendencies that we have to learn how to live with and deal with. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to live with the dog and what happens, what we get a lot of <laughs> and what keeps us I have to say in business, <laughs> we have, we have people who come in and they have a, let's say, I'll give an example of a border collie. We have a border collie that likes to chase the children and it's a problem. Well, um, it would have really been um, awesome if they would have really researched the breed first before getting a dog and, and having that situation, um, you know, be now something they have to fix or get or deal with or, or fix, you know, and it's and and fixing is is going to be pretty relative, right? Um, so, uh, doodles, right? Um, and some of the doodles, they all have different, again, tendencies because it's a mixed breed, and that and that uh, plays a, a part too, right? Again, most every every we're really big on uh, dogs as an individual. However, they do certain breeds do have certain tendencies that we really want to think about before we get that the dog um or to be able to adjust our living situation with that dog if that makes any sense right because if you have a dog that's uh, and i'm going to use a vishla because that's what uh vishlas are lovely dogs but they also are bred to hunt for hours on end uh so the problem is then you're going to put that dog into a condo <laughs> so and your lifestyle maybe isn't where you're out and about a lot it's going to be a tough tough gig for that particular dog right oh yes um tony uh great pyrenees didn't know what a great pyrenees were guard dogs when i complained at barks and overprotective trainer asked me if i looked up what the breed was um and actually Tony, it's so interesting that you say that. I have we have a I have a lovely couple. It's in a reactive dog class that we have. Um, that's a great Pyrenees. Um, and he's lovely, lovely, lovely. And the young couple that owns him um pretty much get it that he, you know, they understand the breed, 
but they just want they just want to tone down the um the lunging and barking which you know he's a young dog um but yeah they are very well aware <laughs> that it's a great pyrenees and that they're guard dogs right and it barks and it's overprotective yeah yeah that's why people get shepherds and then they wonder why they're you know <laughs> why they do what they do. So yeah, that's why it's, um, it's important that you definitely want to kind of think about before you get a dog, you want to think about what they're bred to do, right? I mean, um, cause that matters in there and how you're going to live with the dog and how you're going to select to that within that breed, right? How you select a dog within that breed. If once you decide, okay, I like whatever breed. And then within that, then you're going to, uh, Bring it down and select that, right? Yeah, he was furry and cute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but they get really, really big. Uh, There's yeah. a lot. I've seen great peers are actually like coming around again in a ton of mixed breeds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're coming up from the south or what, but like I yeah. see them in a lot of mixed breed puppies mm -hmm. now. Yeah, no, I have a, we have a, he's, he's a very lovely, um, dog um but they're aware of what he is and um and he's not super overprotective yet he's he's generally likes people but there but some of the things that we're starting to kind of put in um so tony like uh, the great peer put in like good associations with people that people are a good thing and all that but you're still going to have that protective edge to the dog right i mean don't you think so jo joanne it's like <laughs> it's what it is I mean, right, at, no dog, two dogs are ever the same. But, yeah, when we talk about things that are likely to be expressed, right? <laughs> and, and again, I don't even think we need to talk about breed in general as more as the group that they fall in, right? Yes, um, right. Herding breeds, right? Herding breeds chase children and nip heels and stalk things and are overachievers. And, right, <laughs> they, they just – so – um. I think it's important too. like, yes, I have a border collie and we all know the horror stories of owning them and, and they're lovely as well. Right. But, um, don't necessarily even get hung up to the point of this breed does this, right. I think when you think about what was that breed bred as a group to do, mm -hmm. right. That's where you can start to kind of right. get an inkling on what you're going to see. Right. Because for example, a lot of the a lot of the different, um, a lot of the different things that we get with our pet dogs, um, our, our dogs were all selectively bred um, by altering the predatory chase sequence, right, or the predatory uh, predatory sequence. Um, animals are bred to orient, stalk, and there's and there's, and the, the the rest of the sequence, and then. And to eat and dissect, and it helped in the back in the day. It was helpful for them to survive and live, and then we started altering that sequence to serve us for different things. Like for um, for a border collie, uh, you know, they they took away the the kill and dissect because you can't have you. Sh and and again, and as we as um. Joanne said, it's not some, it's the, the, what they fall under. Every dog is still an individual. So you might have dogs with more or less of these certain, um, um, of the sequ of the, in the sequence, but it's still going to be part of it. Like you, it's very un, like most people do not want to board a collie that will kill the sheep because that's no bueno. <laughs> for sheep herders because that's what they're meant to do so the sequence is orient stalk chase grab bite grab shake and then eat it right so in the border collie they took away the shake the grab shake and dissect so that they would just chase it orient and just and manage that sheep right and that's what that's why that now again within the border collies <laughs> Some of that sequence falls, uh, oh, you know, when it's bred, per, when it's a good uh, bred well, uh, it's fine. And when it isn't, it's what it is. Um, same with, um, yes, because Deb, all our, our dogs were selectively bred to do their job, right? That's they, they put in or took out or bred 
um, what they want it to be selective. Like for, um, for example, in labs, um, you want a dog that's going to not, is not going to uh, kill and consume because again, same, they're bred to retrieve it and bring it back. Right. Um, and then within a, in that you have their, they made them more social. So they work with man and all those kind of things. Now, my lab would be a horrible duck hunter because she has a very hard mouth. So within that predatory chase sequence, uh, predatory sequence, it's a very, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, she falls on the more, you know, grabby, bitey sequence part. So, um, but that's how our dogs are, are, are bred. And that's why with breeding, that's how you get some of those genetic tendencies. However, Within those things, when you select a dog and you find a dog that, you know, you like a, a breed that you've researched and that you like, and then, and then select for what your lifestyle is within that, that's where you're going to have a more harmony. And again, you're not going to, it's, it's difficult when you get a dog that has a tendency or a, a, a tendency that you don't like, for example, like a border collie, if you have a bunch of small children and you have a border collie that they stock and orient, it, it's going to be challenging for all involved, <laughs> for all involved, because they can be the nicest dog, but that is going to be tough for that dog and for that family, right? If they, if that's the bread, the breed they choose to have, right? Well, and, and I'll throw in the caveat for, for Joe Schmo. If you give the dog an outlet for that, Right. Then you can curb the dog chasing the children or stalking the children if you give the dog the outlet for that behavior. Right. To a degree. So. Right. And and that's what I mean. And, and again, it goes back to this is why, um, you know, you really want to think about what breed you are wanting to have so that you can either be OK and manage whatever that is. Like, for example, um, in the in the V, I, um, I'll go back to a Vish lab. Fischlers and German short hairs are not are bred to hunt for hours. So, if you have a Vishla that is required that has is more energetic and requires a lot of exercise, and your lifestyle adjusts or can do that, for example, if you're an avid runner or you do a bunch of activities, then your Vishla should be all right, <laughs> should be fine. Um, in your house. But if you have a very sedentary lifestyle that you sit and watch the TV and you have a Vishla and we've had clients, I don't know about you, Joanne, I've had a couple of clients come in. This Vishla's driving me crazy. It's like, yep, because he's bored and he has energy and he's got nothing to not nothing to do with that. And then he's destructive. And that's where things get kind of gnarly um, as you go on. <laughs> Give me a breeder to go to. Mine's mine's like mm, birds. birds. <laughs> Oh, but that, but Joanne, that goes right back to, uh, that's a great point, right? Uh, uh, Joanne's dog and, um, and, and Melanie's dog and all their dogs come from the same breeder and, and Joanne's a hundred percent knows like, eh. <laughs> right. And, and because it's my breed, right. And we're talking about Vishlas and hunting. I will tell you my first Vishla. Um, I got from a di very different breeder. Uh, that dog was amazing. She would have hunted birds 24 seven if you would have let her. Um, and I'm not saying all the time and I can't speak to other breeds, but I will tell you what I have found to be true in the Vishla breed. The, the more driven to hunt birds. And I'm not talking like the dog will go out and hunt birds. I'm talking that inherit it moved. I got to stalk it, right? I got to point it. Though, Just that type of thing when those dogs are super duper duper birdie, I have found them to not be as overly smushy, mm -hmm. <laughs> friendly with people, okay? I 100% agree with that. Not They're saying they're aggressive. Uh, nope. This one was. She snapped at faces. Um, <laughs> but again, right now, knowing what I know now, I ask people, breeders, you know, if I'm going to get another dog and I'm not familiar with your lines or whatever, um, I do ask those kinds of questions, right? Like, how do you have any hunting lines into your breed? Because for me, I don't care. Um, I, I'm not, I don't have a lot of free time. I don't want to keep birds in my freezer. Like <laughs> if my dog really loved it, I would 100% pursue it. But like having a really birdie Vishla is not important to me. Having well, a mushy Vishla is important to me for what exactly. I do. The exactly. stuff 
yeah. So, you know, um, I, I, my, you know, Noah is very different from my first one. Um, well, you, you know, Joanne, I, I, that really, I, I, you know, I never thought of that because that is absolutely a true statement. Really like, hold on. I'm going to show, this is a video that Melanie was kind enough to let me have. Uh, hold on a second. And I apologize for the not being, uh, uh, hold on a second. Sorry, you guys. There we go. Uh, this is a v this is um, Melanie's dog in her backyard. Okay, so hopefully you can see it. Can you make that full screen? It's in the tiny in your um, screensaver. Is it okay? It's yeah, we got Jive and Tango on the other side. I know it's really. It's they don't. It doesn't want me to be bigger. It doesn't let me make it bigger. I don't know why. Okay. All right. Well, I here I'll move it if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> I don't okay. know if it's a lot. Yeah, no, I can't. It's not coming. It's it's, not. I think it's just because you're grabbing it from your phone, right? Like, uh, yeah, no, here, here we go. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, there we go. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. It helps you know which dog to focus on because the shepherd and the lab are pretty too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? Yeah. It's a very short video, but it's. it's so this is a normal behavior for this dog. This is in her backyard. <laughs> right? Poor bird. Not I know. The bird's like, ah! Um, I had another friend with uh, uh, I had another friend with a um, with Vishless too that they were, did you see this one, Joanne? Yep. Yep. So this is her out doing her thing. working what she was naturally bred to do, right? And so going back to uh, Vishla's because I um, I might as well, I don't know why I never had one, but and I, I, I'm around them so much. One of the we things all know why you don't have one. <laughs> Nancy doesn't like dogs that love you that much. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that um, one of the things about Bishlas and sporting dogs, a lot of the sporting dogs, not so much the labs, but some labs, depending on the lines, like Joanne said, um, is they are bred to be very, very persistent, right? You want a dog that has persistence if you would like to do hunting, like Joanne said, if you, if you want a dog that's birdie and, and persistence, you are going to sacrifice some other things. But living with a dog that's persistent is really it's it's not fun tough. it is really tough right you want some persistence especially those of us who do dog sports but you really want to monitor how much persistence you do want because sometimes having a persistent dog that means a dog that's not going to give up and stop wanting and stop you know uh trying to get at some and the levels of persistence change and differ and so you're going to have a difficult time with something like that. So, and like go to Joanne's point, you definitely want to ask the, the, the breeder questions about that particular. Mm -hmm. And, and like, I'm just going to Dave's comment here, right? Uh, the sheep herding lines and cattle working lines of border collies differ in the intensity and desire to move in and grab either faces or heels. We capitalize in this looking at more intense search and rescue prospects, right? So, yeah, like that sucks as a pet dog. Right? Mm -hmm. Like people who like cattle dogs, I God bless you. I know <laughs> not for me, right? Yeah. But I mean, any dog who's 40 pounds and can move a thousand pound animal, that's a tough dog, you know? And um when you're talking about persistence and search and rescue, those dogs are out there sometimes for hours on end running and searching and sniffing. And like, that's the dog who you want that never quits. So um, yep. I think yep. when you're, when, you know, Dave says intensity, sometimes it, maybe it's not necessarily how hard they bite, right. But the, the willingness to stick to that task uh, until completion. Right. Which and make a heck of a working dog in most any sport, 
But again, when you think about that and how it turns into what you have to live with if the dog wants something in your house, uh, that's not fun. Right. So, so here we have um, uh, one of our um, Lori Menarsik's divot um, doing uh, sheep herding. So it goes, it goes back to what they're bred to do and why they are such good. Uh, they're, that's what they're bred to herd sheep. So you, so you want that if this is what you, when they were bred, that's what they were bred to do. So yes, they're, when they're um, definitely they're, um, they see children and they want to gather everybody up together. And depending on um, the lines, right, Joanne, you can mm -hmm. get some really, really um, a lot of um, the border collies with hard eyes and stuff like that because they're they're bred specifically to do more sheep herding, right? Um, so Divot's a sweetheart, so she is. Um, she's uh, lovely and she's doing a whole, she's holding them there because they have to be able to hold them and all that. So, and, and, and this is something that's a, a very natural for this breed to do. Um, now, and Divot's very smushy. She's an extremely social dog. Um, and um, the sheep make her very happy. Um, but this is what they're bred to do, right? They're bred to work and uh, for hours and hours on end. So depending on the lines that you choose, you're going to have to know what you have, what you're doing with that and being able to uh, manage that, that particular situation. So you see how, the, and they have to be pretty obedient and they have to be quick to respond. Um, so it's just, it's, it's, uh, and so you could see why with some of the herding breeds chasing, chasing the um, children or chasing or wanting to keep things together is tough. And when sometimes with play, um, uh, with play, for example, um, dogs that <laughs> uh, the border collies, when they play, if you notice, if you have a border collie playing with other breeds, that's what the, all they want to do <laughs> circle and hurt the dogs. And it's really annoying for some of the other breeds. They don't like that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, going back to what we sort of originally mentioned, a lot of dogs, especially those that work with other animals, right? Um, it does have to do with that predatory sequence. So, when you look at the Vishla or the, the sporting breeds, I would say, when you look at the sporting breeds, gun dogs and the herding breeds, right? It, you do have to remove the, please don't kill it. They're expensive and we want to eat it. Most of them, right. Or move it or not have it damaged. Right. Um, and so when, when you think about in the wild, when all dogs came from originate, you know, where they originated to eat and kill and eat their own things, we've, we've taken that away. Don't eat it. I'll feed you. Help me perform my human job and I will thus reward you, right, by feeding you, taking care of you and all of those things. Where when you take into consideration terriers, okay, now yeah. I love terriers. I think they're fantastic dogs. I love to work with them. I don't own them. Um, and, and they call them tenacious terriers for a reason, right? Most terriers jobs were to go and hunt and kill rodents or... Mm -hmm other things, right? It's the, go get it, go get it and dispose of it. It's the terrier's job in most of them. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that, I think the, the predatory sequence was not altered from At back all. in the day, right? You might not eat it today because I feed you better food than rats, but you know, go get it and kill it. Um, and so understanding, right. If you have other animals in your home, if you have small furry creatures, if you have, you know, um, rabbits in the yard. And again, this is not saying every Terry you ever own is not going to get along with your cat or is going to hunt the bunnies in your yard. But can you expect that might be a high percentage of dogs will do that? You can, right? So, and again, there's no one size fits all, but when we talk about hundreds of years of breeding um, for a job, that was their job. Right. And, and that's a really great example, Joanne, like, uh, terriers and then people wonder why they're not great with other dogs in many cases terriers you know it's having a house full of terriers is is no, is really no for me yeah, well but, it, but right it's a tough it's a tough it's just tough gig to have mm. that many terriers and sometimes you can have two terriers uh, of different sexes same sexes in those breeds can also be uh, a lot more challenging than maybe having two two vishlas of the same sex or two 
um, labs of the same sex, um, it's it can probably not be as big of an issue. But two terriers of the same sex or, you know, sometimes two of the cattle dogs or two of the, you know, might be a tougher. Working breeds is another yeah. one that kind of stuck right. with same sex living together. Yeah. Right. So, so it's one of those things you want to really um, um, think about it. And, you know, then it brings us to the dogs that guard. A lot of people don't like that. You know, it's hard to have a guardian breed if you're like a big Italian family that likes a hundred people over and you have, you know, <laughs> you have a guardian breed. <laughs> it's going to be that, that part of you, that is going to be tough, right? You definitely, if you, if that's your lifestyle, you might want to consider a breed that really enjoys being around people, right? Um, because otherwise it's going to be miserable for all involved. Right. And in, in, in many cases, right. Uh, if yep. you're going to have a lot of people over and all that. So, yep. and you know, some of us, like, that's not why I have Dobermans. I have Dobermans because I love, I love who they are and, and what they do. Right. But I will tell you as a single woman that lives by myself, I, I am never scared owning a Doberman, right? There's nobody that's getting through the door without it. Somebody know the neighbors knowing about it. Right. Um, yes. and, they're going to hear the screams of the guys <laughs> from the blood so, that's as he's ripping his arm off. So, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's a funny thing people don't realize about Dobermans as opposed to like, say uh, the other breeds, right. Is they're like, come on in, let me show you where stuff's at. And you're like, okay, I got my Santa sack. And they're like, Oh, you're not leaving. Why don't you stand in that corner until help? Yeah. Arrive? <laughs> Don't move. So, you know, they, they definitely um, are a very big holding breed. Now, don't get me wrong. If you came at me, that's part of the, the working aptitude test that they test them for is, will they stand their ground and protect you in danger? And a lot of that is in a lot of the working um, tests, right? And a lot of times the breeds, for those of us who have working breeds, um, shepherds are herding breeds, but they're still, to me, they're kind of it's like Malinois, right? They're still herding breeds, but they fall a little into that working category for me. Um, yeah. But, you know, th those types of dogs are, um, they don't, they don't have to turn it on. You don't have to have a dog. that's like, who are you? What are you here for? You know, um, but if danger really presents itself, they're like, got it. Yeah. Well, and the, and the shepherds, if you think about it for herding, they're bred to be human uh, canine fences. So, mm -hmm. It still employs some of that working, right. um, working line, um, working line, uh, you know, mentality. So, so this is the first part. I think you guys were were ta we were talking about like this is the first part. You really have to research the breed, and I wish more people would do would do that. It's it would really alleviate a lot of sad sad cases, and it would alleviate a lot of issues and problems from the beginning, right? Like it would, it would just eliminate, like you really have to look at what your lifestyle is and, and, and the dog or the breeds that you're considering, you know, looking at if you're going to get a dog. Um, no. Now, go ahead. Nope. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your thought. So, so then, then, so now we're going to talk a little bit about like, okay, I like whatever breed. So how do you pick one for your life? And for your home, right? Because just because there's general tendencies in the breed and certain things that you do that you will see, you still then have to just, you know, then you have to narrow it down to the individual dog, right? Because like I said, I have two labs. One has a very hard mouth. The other one doesn't, right? It's, but it's the same breed, but mm -hmm. You know, there's, um, and so that's where you have to start looking at the individual. But I think, I think one of the things I'd like to, I'd like to see if, if I could, if I had a um, magic wand is like that people really think about the breed that they're getting before they go out and grab it because it's so, they're so cute and they're so this, it would be so much, I think it would be easier, I think. If you get a dog and you know these are certain tendencies and you're okay with those tendencies and then you're just going to live with it, you know, then choose the dog that's going to suit you. But most people just say, oh, he's cute and I like him. And and then they get him home and it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> you walked right up to me and snuggled in. You're like, yeah, he's super social. But in all the other ways, he's not so fun. But so before you move, I'm going to I want to I want to segue this um, because there are a lot of rescue dogs. Right. And so. 
um, shelter dogs, rescue dogs, most, most of them don't pay for DNA tests. So you can take a wild guess or you can take their guess. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to show you guys something. Um, Kim Brophy, who is an ethologist, she's doing a lot of work with, um, the kind of uh, breed groups and types and, and trying to change, um, some of the outlook on owning dogs and, and that sort of stuff. But so she's developed a tool um, which is called the dog key, uh, canine genetics. And so it's going to give like a six question, um, option for you. So you could take this, pull it up on your phone at the shelter, look at the dog. Okay. And you could, you can plop this in here, um, and kind of just see, uh, what, what might go into this dog. So I'm going to show you guys this here real quick. Um, so I'm going to take Roscoe who, uh, he, I knew for a fact, just by his breed characteristics that he was, um, primarily herding breed. And I could just tell that, um, because of working with him. Right. So you can't see everything about him and he's black on black. So sorry about that, but I just want you to take a quick look at him. Right. He was listed as a Roddy mix, um, in mm. rescue when I first started fostering him. So when you, when you plug this in, what I want you guys to, to know is when you answer these questions, they should be done when the dog is relaxed, not when the dog's amped up or, you know, looking at a toy or anything like that. This should be like the nice relaxed dog in the yard sniffing around. Okay. So if you look at him, he's got short hair. Um, let me move this just a smidge so you can see, whoops, a little bit more of his body type tail. Um, I'm just doing some trick stuff with him. So he, uh, sorry, trying to get you what he looks like when he's standing up. I didn't have it queued up. Um, so when he stands up, he's got your average body, short hair, kind of a nice little droppy tail here. Um, so anyway, so there's that. So we're going to go, this is the dog Okay. So you're going to take the tests and we'll just use Roscoe as an example. So as an adult, uh, he weighs about 55 pounds. So I'm going to pick his weights. Okay. Don't do this with puppies, um, really under six months. Cause they may not be what they look like yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to pick his ears. He actually has semi erect ears, um, mm -hmm. or a small triangle. So, um, I actually, I lied. He, yeah, he has kind of yeah. small triangle ears. Yeah. They kind of hang out to the side and tip over a little bit. So I'm going to pick mm -hmm. small triangle. Um, what kind of tail does he have? He really does have a swoop tail, meaning yep. it kind of hangs down, you know, when he's at rest. Um, when we look at some of these, right, like clearly that's a pug tail. That's a, <laughs> you know, boxer, Doberman. There's a beagle, right? This is some sort of hound. <laughs> so yeah. um, we'll pick the swoop tail. Um, what kind of body does he have? I would go between basic and block. And when you really look at him, he does have a nice tucked waist. Yeah. So I'm going to go with basic body. Okay. And what kind of hair does he have? Um, it is about an inch long. Yeah, it's so short. Pretty short hair. Okay. Um, and there are examples for each one of these, right? So if we picked super slick, you kind of can see like Vishla, right? Short right. hair, about an inch long. Okay. So we'll do that and you're going to click see my results. Okay. So looks like your ancestry is a herding dog, which if you, I did his DNA, he is uh, a large percentage of herding breed. He's got border collie, Aussie cattle dog in him. Okay. So it kind of talks about, um, what, what I expect, um, what can be hard things to live with. Right. So nice things and difficult things. If I scroll down a little bit, can also see he may have some bully breed in him. Okay. And he does, he has a little bit of pity in him. Okay. Um, and so, you know, does he have a little more? He does. He's got some Labrador in him. He's got, um, a little bit of Roddy in him. Okay. Um, but when we talk about Kim and what she does, one of the big things that she talks about is if there's less than 30% of a breed or a breed like type like that herding group, right? He's way more than 30% herding breeds. Um, if there's less than 30%, you may not see 
that uh, okay. grouping, right? Like you may see bits and pieces, but usually if there's at least 30% or more, you're going to start seeing those characteristics come through more so than you would something else. Um, mm -hmm. And again, he, uh, that's what I thought before I ever did the DNA test. He's, he speaks to me as a herding breed. He has a lot of herding breed tendencies um, in how he learns and how he behaves. Um, and it, so it was funny to see that come back. Like, sure. And I found this after the fact. I'm like, well, look, that totally lines up. Yeah. Um, so if you have a mixed breed dog, um, it's the dog key.com. You can with it. Um, or if you, you know, work at a shelter with rescues, anything like that, just, just play with it and see what you get. Uh, you can change some of the characteristics a little bit and sometimes you end up with the same thing or it removes the second breed or adds a different second grouping. Um, but it's kind of fun that way. So <clears throat> if you want to know, I always, I just thought it was really interesting. Take to the shelter, take to the rescue. You know, you can do it at home while you're looking at pictures. If you're looking for any rescue dog, that's a mix. Right. Um, something interesting. Well, yeah, because, it, and, and like I said, some, some of the tendencies that some of the breeds like Joanne alluded to, they may have the same, they may have, they might be part of that breed, but they might not, de they might not demonstrate any of the uh, tendencies that that breed um, um, has. Stop it. Stop <laughs> pushing me. Uh, um, and so just, again, just because he's that breed doesn't mean you're going to see all of those uh, tendencies. Right. And this is where we go uh, to the more individual dog. When you start looking for a dog, um, how you want, you know, how, what's going to work for your home and your lifestyle. So, um, so go, now going back, so let's say, okay, I like the German shepherds, right. But I like how smart they are. I like how intelligent they are. I like their work ethic, even though mine doesn't seem to have that <laughs> for my first one did, but, but one of the things I, for my own personal shepherd, I needed to have a shepherd that was more social that like people more. It was more very important to me, so I was looking specifically for a shepherd that was a more social type of dog. Um, and so, when I was looking for a shepherd, or I was looking for that for, for the one I wanted, I was specifically looking for certain characteristics in the breed that I needed to have to be able to um, to ha to have him in my life. I couldn't have, uh, you know, a super high working line shepherd because my lifestyle wasn't going to adapt to that. Right. So um, and one of the first things I do see is sociability in the dog. I need a dog that's going to be um, relatively social. They don't have to love everybody, but I want them to be pretty social um, with people because of my my lifestyle. I'm around people all the time. They're going to be that's going to be part of what they're going to have to deal with. So. So it's very important that that's a. That's a, a, a trait that I'm going to look for in any dog of any breed that I um, I get, right? Um, so, and you can see this as early as eight weeks. I think, Joanne, do you have video of, of, of the... That? Puppies? Whatever, yeah. Uh, so one of the things you want to do is when you first meet a puppy or if you're going to... Um, to look at a dog, whether it's a puppy, an adult, or, or, or a puppy... The first thing you want to do is if the dog will come to you or in the, look for interaction with you unprompted. That's really, really important. Like if you just show up, what does the dog do? The, does it, is, is it interested in coming to see you? Does it want to be next to you? Does it approach you? Does it want to have some kind of uh, uh, interaction with you, right? It's really, really important. You want to see that. And 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 it varies, and it's it's at very varying degrees, right? You have a dog that will come immediately to you, and then you have other dogs that might take a little while to get to you, or some dogs that have no desire to come nearby to you, right? Um, and again, it's not right or wrong. It's just this is what the dog's going to be, or this is part of who his personality is as far as being sociable with people. Yep. <clears throat> um. I will show you the social stuff. Uh, there's there's two puppies I recently rescued, just recently took in, and I assessed. And so um, I'm just going to show you the first, you know, 30 seconds of this, um, so you can kind of see uh, what it, you know, just the difference. There, these are the same. These are litter mates, same dogs. Um, let me get there. Sorry. 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm technically challenged tonight. All right. So if we look at these guys here, this is the little boy dog. So just being put into the room, there's some food in here. So, um, and you know, again, without any kind of like, hey puppy, come here, right? There's a human four feet from you. He's like busy. I'm very busy, right? And so, and I'll just tell you, this went on. <laughs> for wow, like a minute, almost two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, where this dog never came off of this. Yeah. So, what does that so, show you? Yeah. Well, and one of the things that 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 shows, and going back to the persistence piece, right? Mm -hmm. He's very persistent on it, and that over that over powered everything everything else right it's like he was much more interested in in that that was more important to him than um yeah than anything else in the room right yeah okay so this is his sister i granted i'm in a different room but his setup is very similar right so just literally just put the puppy down go check out the weird thing with the face and then immediately hello <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that was what? 10 seconds. And that puppy was like human. Right. And she actually remains here hanging out for quite a bit next to me. Right. She can, she checks back in. She, she asks for a little more interaction. Um, so, you know, same exact litter. One was like busy. Right. One was now, granted, it w could I have made it different and put the food in the exact same place and see what happens? Um, I could have, but, you know, it it's all that would have shown is, you know, how if the dog wanted to stick to food more than people. So I could have done it differently, right? You, it, to show you truly the exact right. same setup. But I'm going to tell you if I did it again and I set it up the exact same way, that puppy's going to come for people because she's just, she's never met a stranger. That's the Walmart greeter of little pity puppies. Yeah. And, um, and uh, Jennifer said that she noticed a lot at the shelter, some breeds would rather just run than interact with us at all. Well, and the, and Jen, the, the big thing is when you are looking for, when, whether it's a breeder or at a shelter, you really want to meet the dog away from other, you know, away from other dogs and other you know what i mean because it's like if there's other some dogs are they much rather run and play because especially at the shelter they they don't get a lot of uh, stim stimulation so they might choose you know to run to just run because they need to decompress or you know get that energy out so anytime when you're looking at a dog you know you want that you you definitely want that um the dog to be away from his litter mates. A lot of people choose their dogs with, uh, it, you know, all the puppies are presented and then you just pick one. Well, unfortunately you really don't know what you're getting because they're all with their litter mates. So the one that seems the boldest a lot of times is, more, is can be a little shy and worried away from his litter mates versus a dog that maybe looks shy and worried, but when it's away from his litter mates. So always, always never pick a puppy um, with, when it's around all the other dogs, same with, you know, a shelter, they, you need to be some, uh, some, spend some alone time, uh, with, with the dog. Right. Yep. But, but, you know, to Jen's, um, point, right. So you said that they'd rather just run than interact. So try it a different way. Right. When you walk down the aisle, there are dogs that are like whoop, right up at that gate and their tails are wagging like, Hey, good morning. How are you? Right. That is absolutely if you're not coming with the food bowl, you know, or after they've been fed, that is the dogs telling you, I love people, I'm social. Um, and you see them doing that with person after person that walks down through that shelter versus the dog who lays in the back, sometimes who's like, eh, don't care. Now, that being said, in that shelter environment, eh, yeah. it's hard to test in there because you can have a dog that's shut down or, or you know, super stressed. Um, so you don't get the accuracy there. But usually you don't. The dog that's overly social, you're not going to miss that because they are the ones who are up there wagging their tails like high, high, high. Yeah, and and to be fair, and to be honest, you guys, one of the things if your dog isn't social or could isn't social with people and hasn't really bonded with you, 
it is less likely that if they have other behavior issues, the people are going to want to work through that. Many times, if the dog is, is dogs that are, have, are social and that love their people, people are willing to work with whatever behavior issues they might have versus dogs that are, don't give it, you know, don't have that back at you. Now, what, having said that, there are people who absolutely don't mind a dog that's, you know, that they can be in the same room and hang out and they don't have to be on your lap, right? Um, and they're fine. And that's a, you know, there's a dog for everyone. So um, again, it doesn't, it, it may, that's why you have to really decide what you want for your family and for you. Um, if you have a dog that's kind of super needy um, and all that, and you can handle that and give him what it needs. Wonderful. If you can't. That's why Nancy doesn't own a Bishla. <laughs> I know when I need uh, somebody to lay across my lap. But, you know, it's it's funny you say that, though, because, like, that's what I wanted. And when I was 20 and I moved out of the house and I got my first dog, that's what my idea was, right? Like, I want this loving companion and we're going to sleep and, and, you know, snuggle and cuddle and all of those things. And the dog I got was like, I love you very much, but I'm going to sit over here. And it breaks your little heart, right? Because you're like, you don't love me. But they do. They just are like, I'm not a snuggler. I don't like it. Don't do it. Like, I will sit on the couch next to you. I don't want to touch you. Um, and so it, that is a trait, you guys. That's a thing. Um, and it doesn't mean the dog loves you any less. It really doesn't. It's just some people are like that, too. Like, I, I'm not. Don't be a hugger. I'm not. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nancy, Nancy is a Vishla. That's why she doesn't want one. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And my animals tend to, they went hugging all the time instead of occasionally. <laughs> so, um, but yes, it, and that, and that's true of, and that, again, it's like Joanna said, it doesn't mean they don't love you, but for some people, so you can see how you can have a mismatch. Right. Um, and I remember Suzanne showed me a, picture of a video of a, of a guy that was looking to adopt this dog and the dog was like totally fine sitting next to him and being by him but didn't want all that touching and the guy was clearly wanting to be touching 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 the dog and it was a very very challenging that was just such a, a mismatch so you really have to if you are uh, if you're a, of that person that you can just sit there and hang out and be and be, have the dog be in the same room and that's good enough for you. There's lots of dogs like that. And if you need, if you have, you know, if you want need the huggling, hugging and kissing and all that, you can get a golden or a Vishla. Both of those will give you that. Oh, I remember that Nancy was trying to rehome a Malinois, and uh, this guy, she's like, oh. he's he's a little nervous, like you know, just don't don't try and t and you. The guy was like. <laughs> Yes, I remember he that. He could not keep his hands to himself. And the dog's like, don't do it, man. Like, <laughs> I remember that. That's that not was going to go well. I'm sorry. I don't think you're a good match. <laughs> like, wow. Yes, actually, and and um, yeah, that was XO. And and yeah, it, well, I knew right from the start that was not going to be a good match for this particular <laughs> That was going to be hell for both of those. Um, fortunately, he found a lovely, wonderful home that accepts them for what they are and for what he is. And and he loves them and he cuddles with them um, and they understand him. And he's living a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful life. But yeah, it, it, we found a good match for him. But that would have been a horrible match. Joanne's right. He could not not touch him. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> It's just literally like, <laughs> don't do it. So I had so, to walk out of the room. I was giggling too much, but because I, I, I had to do the dirty work of telling him that that wasn't going to work. Why I mean, don't you give him a cookie instead? Here, hold the bag. Like, <laughs> yeah, and it was it was clearly the dog was not having it, and people just can't help you know can't help it. So that's why you really want to think about it. Like the sociability is such a big deal and it can make a break a relationship for sure. I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff too that is, is, can be a problematic or, or you want to consider, but that is a huge, huge um, consideration for people. You want, you want that dog to be able to, 
you know, because I'm going to be honest, and I was talking to Deb Evans um, today. Uh, one of the things you can hand, you know, most of the dog issues you can work on. The dog, the, the human dog aggression is really, really hard. It's just, <laughs> it's just so stressful and so hard for all. Um, and it's just, it's just the more, the more complicated of, of situations. So it's really something that you want to really um, consider, like, don't <laughs> uh, get a, you know, get a dog that likes people, right? Because it just trying to deal with the rest of it is just so challenging. Right. Um, do you have other video, Joanne, of? Um, I, sure. What would you like? I got lots. <laughs> um, so anyway, and one of the things I wanted you to look at, one of the things to consider with the, with the, the male pity, it's the persistence on that particular thing, right? Um, on, the, on the food. So while he didn't get over aroused, because sometimes food over arouses dogs, he didn't. But he also could not come yeah, off of it until, until, until you physically removed him from it. And so while it's cute when they're eight weeks, it's not so cute when they're 18 months old and they want something and they can't and they can't have it. And they're going to still like do whatever they need to, to get it. So it's something to consider. Now, if you're like some of us that do performance, we do we do like a little bit more persistence, right? Because it's good for working. They're going to keep going and they're going to keep working. My um, my shepherd not super persistent. Like he'll be like, okay, if that's if it's a no, it's a no. Or my lab, she is a lot more persistent. Um, and I'll give you an example from a sporting perspective. I was uh, we were doing nose work today. Uh, she told me about a hide. It wasn't her, didn't look like a normal alert for me. So I didn't call it and I left it and she came with me and then she goes, nope, I really want that. And she went back to it three times and told me like, nope, really, this is something I want. I should tell you about. And, and I, and she was right, but she persisted in like, I really want this, right? She was able to, where my shepherd boy would have been like, okay, guess we're not getting that one. <laughs> He'd be okay to leave it. So you see how that will, that comes in, in handy. But it's also very annoying when, you know, she wants a piece of food, a kibble under the fridge. That's going to be, that's going to be tough. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I, um, I'll show you guys what we mean about food. Just because these puppies were fun to, well, and. I don't know if I want to even go into that. Um, careful when you assess dogs, because I looked at these puppies the week prior to actually doing an assessment on them. And I was like, oh my gosh, like these are not adoptable puppies. They were terrible, uh, biting and, and just really bad. And I was like, these are going to be real special placements. I saw them a week later, they were fine. So they brought them for the assessment. And what I had found was they got the rabies shot that day. So, uh, and that's the second time somebody has brought me puppies to assess the day they got their shots mm. and it's a pain in the butt, but I tell people I'm not doing it. Um, and it may seem like nothing, but you know, if you guys are going to go meet a new dog, make sure they have not had vaccines or like a ton of medical work done that day. Like, you know, it's their first toenail grind or, you right. know, they had a big vet visit, something like that, because you're not going to get the full dog. Um, right especially in puppies. So but. yes, absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hang on one second. Let me, so what we are going to show you is uh, food and how it can change how excited a dog gets. So just showing a quick little, Hey, can you get on this little um, wobble board disc? Right. I do not have food. So the puppy's happy, wiggly, interested, following around, Nice little girl walking with me. Okay. She's just sort of checking stuff out. Do, 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 do. Um, okay. So now I'm going to, I'm actually just going to grab a little piece of food from here. Okay. And she's happy. Nice little girl. As soon as she knows, and I have a little piece of cheese. So as soon as she smells the cheese in my hand, I want you to watch the difference. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if you guys can't tell what we're looking at here, I want you to see, just look at the quality of her movement, okay? As she comes walking over, 
She's happy she's bouncy, her tail's wagging, okay? But she's very aware of where her feet are. She's very aware of where I am, what I'm doing. As soon as she smells that food, she almost stops paying attention to where she's going and what she's doing. She's so focused on the food. We get leaping, we get jumping, we get, um, you know, her mouth got harder. So just the quality, see how she knocks things over. Um, she's almost not paying attention to what's happening. So understanding and poor Nancy, her jive is like this, right? Um, yes. <laughs> food yes. excites the dog so much sometimes that, um, you get less productivity when you increase, uh, you know, when you have a heavy reward. So like if she brought out chicken, right, that dog may not even understand what's going on anymore. Her little brain, the, the gerbil is smoking on the, on the wheel. <laughs> right. And um, that right. It, it seems so subtle, but trust me, there's no, there's, there's no question in my mind that that is real. And that will follow that dog to adulthood. Right. right. So but I know Nance, like you can talk about how you can't use good food when you need yeah. a dog to think. So with Jive, I I can use Charlie Bears, uh, Kibble, and she's just as eager to work for it. Anything crunchy. Where my Shepherd, he 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 needs like you know chicken steak. If I try to use steak or um or chicken with my lab, she will lose her mind and she her focus will d diminish her performance will diminish because she's so excited about the food where for the shepherd, it brings it up. He, he enjoys it. He likes that, you know, the higher end and the, the, the you know, the higher end of food, the happier he is. So, mm -hmm. so for my lab, that would be detrimental. Absolutely. Yep. And I, you know, I'm going to, I don't know, like I don't see it as often. It's not rare. But like I don't see it as often where dog the the food thing really pushes dogs over the edge to be unproductive, um, but it's something that's noteworthy, right? So like if I was gonna pick that pity puppy, to I don't know be a confirmation dog, like I'm not, it's a rescue, right? But or something where they have to stand still, like obedience, right? You have to do a sit stay, that type of thing. I'm gonna be very careful and understand if I'm bringing out the chicken or steak that dog may not be able to comply with that command as they're learning it because they're so excited about right. the food versus, right. I might get you a Charlie bear or something like, you know, a crunchy little whatever. Um, and the dog's like, Oh yay, food. Um, so it's, there's all these little subtleties and this is why if you really, really truly want help, you know, uh, picking out your next performance dog or a dog that's going to work really wonderful for your family. Um, there is no harm in asking, you know, somebody like Nancy or myself, people who really understand behavior and how to dissect it into pieces, you know, how, what'll be a good fit for you and your family. Right. Because it's really, um, and you really have to have re really understand what you, I think when the family understands what they really want in a pet, it just makes it easier. Um, cause it's like, oh, we just want a friendly dog. Well, how friendly do you want it? Do you want it to be, I mean, there's degrees, right? Um, right. or you want to wear my clothes, right? <laughs> or do you want somebody, oh, I want to protect the house. Well, how, you know, with that request comes some other things that you may not like, right? Cause you want them to protect the house from strangers, but they also might protect the house from your other, from your, from your kids, friends and mm -hmm. from, you know, the, the UPS guy and from, you know, all those things. So, you know, you want to really think about what that means to you and what you really want and what degrees you're looking for. Because I think people just in general, I just want a family pet. Well, what does that look like? Because a family pet to one person is not the same as another one. So you mm -hmm. really want to think about what would make a good family pet for your family. Do you have kids? Do you, are they, are they young, really young? Are they teenagers? Are they, you know, cause it's like, cause a lot of people buy, um, dogs for kids that are 10, 11 years old. The problem is at that age, they enjoy it, but eventually they're going to become teenagers. <laughs> and guess what? You better like that breed because you're going to end up um, dealing with it while the kid goes through adolescence. I mean, that's, that's what we see a lot of. Yep. And 
one of the other things, because I know there's a lot of people on here who, you know, do go to breeders. And I mean, we support both, right? I did rescue for years. And in my early 20s, I was like, don't buy from breeders. It's bad. Dogs die. And, <laughs> you know, the, the smarter that I get about it, that's true with some breeders. But the breeders that we, I know, Nancy and I, we get our dogs from, like, I could have a 12-year-old dog with cancer. And if something happened to me, my breeders would take the dog back. You know what I mean? That's the commitment that those that we go to have to the dogs they produce. So, um, so if you know your breeder and even if you don't, you know, if you're making a lifetime purchase and they're committed to that dog, they're going to take the time with you to answer any questions that you have. Right. Um, and so, you know, ask those questions, right? If, if let's just say you want a shepherd or you want a Vishla or whatever, like if I wanted a shepherd, I'm going to say, you know, um, what are the generations, you know, like, can I meet the mom and dad? Cause you know, sometimes they don't have the dad on site, which is right. Most of the stuff comes from mom. Most of the DNA comes from dad, but, um, not always, but a lot of the time, a lot of the temperament stuff, uh, mom will be heavy on. So if mom comes out and she growls at you, <laughs> you know, you can pretty much assume your dog, your puppy might be territorial, might you know, mm -hmm. not be super social, might not like strangers. Um, if they're afraid of life, you know, fear is one of the highly her most heritable things passed down from mom to puppies. Right. Um, so it, take the time to meet mom and dad. And if they won't show them to you, I, I personally, yep. Nope. Unless there's a big reason, like, well, she's sick or something, right. I'm not buying from you or right. tell me when I can and I'll come back. Right. Um, well, like and, I and, just, I just won't. Right. Well, and, and if there's a dog that you like, um, that's how I ended up with the labs and the breeder I have of my labs. I was doing a seminar at, um, in, in her, in that neck of the woods, I was staying. She, this person was a president of the club. I stayed at her home. Um, I met Jive's mom, fell in love with the dog. And I, that was, I, I said, Hey, if, um, you ever breed this dog, I would be interested in a puppy. And a year later, there we go. And now I have two <laughs> of, of her, uh, of her um, dogs and they're, they're, you know, they're wonderful. I, I, you know, she does a nice job of raising them and, and I get to see the parents and she is very thoughtful about the dad. And even though I didn't get to see the dad, I got to see video of the dad and, on, on, you know, on any information I needed, I was able to see it right for both dads. So it's something to consider. And again, same with rescue. You can find really lovely, lovely dogs that are uh, in the, in the rescue and just, uh, just a, a quick assessment is going to make, is the, makes the biggest difference. So having where you can meet the dog and spend some one-on-one -on -one time with it is really helpful. And I think you can at most shelters anyway. Right. And rescue. Most rescue groups are, I mean, a lot of them are fosters, right? So they'll happily introduce you to the dog. They want to make sure those dogs are going to the right fit as well. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause they don't want to have to get it back. Right. So. Um, so anyway, so one of the reasons, one of the reasons I wanted, and I, I know I, I said it when we started is the more you understand the, what you're getting and how you select it, it's just going to make the relationship better, right? It's very similar to when you start dating someone, you get to know them, you get to know their personality, you get to know their quirks. And then you decide, because no one's perfect, then you can decide, okay, these are things I can live with. And some are things that are deal breakers that you, that are, you, you know, you're not going to, you can't have, right? Um, and those are things that you should stick to no matter how bad it feels sometimes like if you if you need a dog that's going to be more social and this dog one dog checks off all those boxes but mm, this is just a concern or it's a red flag or you have a bad feeling about it go with it because usually you're right right on the money about it right anyway thank you all for tuning in um we will uh um see you all next week and um, we have in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Dr. Um, Sutter, who's going to be talking about the dog's digestive. I think she's doing it May 7th. Um, so anyway, keep tuned in and uh, we'll uh, check our um, Facebook pages as well um, for additional information. Anyway, have a great rest of your weekend and we'll see you all soon.
Thanks, everybody. Bye.